Father's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful fathers out there. Not just for being shining examples of how great a dad can be, but also for being wonderful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important. Just knowing you're there when we need you. You've been patient with us, helping us to grow and learn from all the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today, we thank you, Dad, for all of this and so much more. Happy Father's Day. Awesome. So, happy Father's Day. So thankful to be with you guys this morning. Thank you for coming this morning as we hear from the Word of the Lord. My hope is, is that for us as men and dads that we will be challenged this morning. I love how on Mother's Day, right, they get honored. On Father's Day, we get challenged, right? So uh, if you're joining with us this morning and you're a guy and you, you hope to come feel good about yourself, you probably came to the wrong place, I don't know. But I'm, I'm, my hope is, is that we will challenge each other this morning as we look at the word of the Lord and uh, be left with a an application process for us as we lead our families. Uh, this morning, my, my pops is not here, and so he's in Mexico. He's uh, serving there. He's preaching. I think he said he was preaching five times in three days. So uh, he's working hard, and uh, I'm sure he's preaching right now this morning. I'm, I'm sure he's going to watch eventually, and so, Dad, if you're watching, happy Father's Day. So thankful for the example that you've been in my life. I have been so blessed to watch you lead and to watch you love Jesus and, and love your family, and uh, thank you. Happy Father's Day. So um, happy Father's Day again. This morning, we're going to cover this idea, what makes a man a man? What makes a man a man? Me and Ethan were talking about it this morning in our Sunday school class, and I asked him the question. He had lots of good answers. And... Uh, uh, ultimately, what makes a man is the way in which he leads his family. Who is the manliest man of all time? I, I want to ask, does, what's, who's the manliest man of all time? There could be any answers. Maybe somebody might say like Chuck Norris. I don't know. Somebody might say uh, Ray Lewis. I don't know, like just a mean middle linebacker. I don't know who your example is of the manliest man of all time. Uh, but for me, I'm going to Jesus juke you this morning, right? And I'm going to say the, the manliest man of all time is Jesus Christ. I think that he is the manliest man of all time. And I think that a lot of times, like, we get this false impression of who Jesus was and what he looked like. Like, for some of you, when you think of Jesus, you see this picture, all right? And I hate to break it to you, but, like, I studied about Jesus, right? I studied that he was a carpenter, that he was like a bad dude, right? Like he, not bad, but you know what I mean. Like he was, he was probably like, he was toting around. They didn't just like have like two by fours at the lumber store, right? Like he had to go cut down a tree and carry the log and he had to plane it out by himself. He was a carpenter and he was probably, you know, yoked, right? He was probably built like, like a carpenter, right? And so like this idea of Jesus is just, just that's that's not what Jesus looked like in any way, shape, or form. Like he did not have he did not look European like that, right? So the the, the next one is more of what I imagine <laughs> Jesus to be, right? And you know I may be wrong, but I'm more right than the first one, right? Than the fools who painted that first painting. Um, like this is what I imagine Jesus to be. He was the ultimate. Man, and, and I'm kind of kidding, you know. Um, I may be wrong too, but I'm less wrong than the fools that think that J Jesus looked like the first picture. But regardless, 
Jesus was the manliest man of all time, not because of his stature, but because of his ability to construct, provide, and ultimately sacrifice. My bottom line this morning, dads, if you're taking notes, is the ultimate measure of a man is not found in his stature, it's found in his sacrifice. And that is why I think Jesus is the manliest man of all time. And we're going to learn from his example this morning. I believe that godly men do three things well. I'm going to preach to you on three different things that I believe godly men do well. The first is that they construct. Godly men love their family by the way that they construct. They love their family by constructing something well. Jesus constructed, he, as I mentioned, he was a carpenter. He was in construction, right? He probably constructed many, many different things, but more importantly, he constructed the church. The reason we meet and the reason that we worship is because he, he constructed this religious, right, this, this church, this movement. He constructed in the way in which he led his disciples and he he uh, ordained the church and he constructed it. Good construction, I wrote this down, stands the test of time. And for men, you have an opportunity to build your family in a way to where what you build on will stand for the test of time. Good construction stands the test of time. Every man is building something. So my question to you this morning, if you're a father or if you're a man of any sorts, I want, to, I want to ask you, what are you building? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 says this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, there's two examples found in this passage. There was a wise man who built his life on the rock, and then there was a fool who built his life on the sand. And he said, the fool is the one who hears my words and does not do them. And so here we're learning from this example that you're building something. You're building something. And so my question to you is, what are you building? Are you like the wise man who built his house on the rock by hearing the words and doing them? I think that it takes three things to have good construction. I think, I think that you have to plan well. I think you have to communicate well. And I think that you have to execute well, in Proverbs 21, verse 5, it says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who hasty comes only to poverty. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. I think that there's this false idea for us as men because I think that we sometimes feel like we need to always seem like we have it under control and that we can, that we can uh, maneuver and we can we can manipulate and we can uh, kind of work on the fly that, that we don't have to plan. Like, like for, for, for some of us, we think that planning is actually not manly. Like, I don't plan. I just, I just do whatever I need to do, right? But when it comes to building your, your, and constructing your family, you have to plan. You have to have a, a, a game plan. You have to say, this is what my family is going to be about, and then you have to communicate your plan. And so, men, I want to challenge you this morning. If you don't have a construction plan for your family, I want to challenge you. Go home. Break out a pencil. Open up a notebook and start jotting down things like, what is my family going to be about? What are we going to do? What's the non-negotiables for me and my family? What are some practices that we need to start right now so that we make good plans to build good construction? And I want to challenge you to do that. And then once you jot those things down, once you come up with your game plan for your family, I want you to communicate it to your family. I want you to communicate it to your wife. Say, this is what I believe God's calling us to do for, for us and our family. And I believe that we're going to do it in this way. And I need your help. And I need my kids to know that this is what we want to accomplish. And then the next step is to execute that plan. How is a good house built? A good house is built brick by brick. And here's what I've come to realize just as I'm a young man who's leading a young family with three kids. I've learned that this takes consistency. You can't say thing, something one time and then expect everything to be dandy, right? It takes consistent 
work, brick by brick. You have to execute your game plan consistently. Recently, I was able to see a good plan on full display. Uh, this past week, as we were ministering to the kids of, of, of Sable Palms during our su summer camp, we partnered uh, with a guy by the name of Josh. Josh. Josh leads a soccer ministry here in Jacksonville to refugee families. It's called All Nations. It's an incredible ministry. You should go check it out. So he joined us this week at Sable Palms, and uh, he led our, our, our kids through different soccer games, but more importantly, every morning we started off with worship. We sang songs, we learned truths about God's word, and he uh, led us uh, through the study that Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me, and you'll see that here in, in, in a moment. Um, but, but what I saw uh, this week is that this guy named Josh, who leads this all-nation soccer ministry, uh, he came up with a plan for his family. And he said, my family is going to be all about this. And, and, and this week, he didn't just show up by himself. He brought all three of his boys, right? And his boys are all under the age of five. And he brought them alongside him because he wasn't just going to be about serving people. He was going to make his family about serving people. People. And so he brought his young boys as much as they were to handle as he was trying to accomplish the goal that he wanted to accomplish. He wanted his kids to experience what it felt like to serve people. And he did that this week, and it was on full display. So uh, he created this little video of our week and uh, what it looked like. So let's play this little video. 
turns void. And so what, what they memorize will stick with them forever. Like those little soccer games, they'll come and go. They will not remember that goal that they scored to win that game, but they'll remember God's word. And I think that that is awesome. And so Josh is all about that. So we were leaving, we wrapped up the week. It was an incredible week. And Josh uh, shook my hand. He said, thank you so much for the opportunity that you gave me for me and my family to come serve with you this week. And he told me this as he was leaving. He said, I'm just so thankful that my boys got to come and you allowed them to, to come. And he said this, because this is all I want them to know. And I thought to myself, you see, this is a man who came up with a plan for his family. He communicated it to his family and he executed the plan and, and, and it was very simple, right? It's very simple, it was one thing, this is all I want them to know is serving other people. And so my question to you dads this morning is what is your plan? What's the simple strategic plan for you and your family that you can communicate and you can execute? What is your goal? What is your, your family's purpose? I wanna challenge you to this, go home. Write down your family purpose statement. Make a purpose statement for your family. Just as, just as if you were to create a business and you came up with a new model, you would make a purpose statement or a mission statement for that business or for that ministry or whatever it might be, right? I want you to do that for your family. For me and my family, right, we're gonna serve the Lord and here's how we're gonna do it. And so I want you to, to encourage you to do that. Josh had a plan for his family. It was communicated, it was executed. And if Josh fails at everything else, he's going to succeed at giving those boys an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. He said, this is all I want them to know. All right, and so I wanna challenge you to go home and construct a simple plan for your family to succeed in this week, right? We talked about it's brick by brick. Sometimes we come up with these you know, massive plans and, and, and we're unable to, to follow through because we just need to start somewhere. Build it brick by brick, right? All right, the second point is this, uh, that godly men do this well. They provide for their family. Godly men love their family by providing. You see, Jesus modeled this by providing a way back to the Father. He provided a way for us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Right? He provided his own life for us. Jesus said, I will give you water and you will never thirst again. And for some of you guys, you're reading this point and you're like, oh, man, if I fail at everything else, I got the providing one down, right? Like you're thinking to yourself, I provide for my family. I always have and I always will. If there's anything true about me, I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna put on the hard hat and I'm gonna go to work, and I'm gonna grind, and my family's always gonna eat, right? Some of you guys are, are thinking that right now. You're, you're pumping yourself on the chest, and you're thinking, I got this one covered, right? And, 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 and maybe for some of you, you're like, we're not just gonna eat, right? We're gonna eat good. Like, I'm talking like, you know, Boston butt on the smoker, right? I'm talking ribs, I'm talking steaks. Like we ain't just eating hot dogs, right? And you're like, I'm gonna provide for my family. We're gonna have things that, that, that allow us to have good memories and to make memories and to have fun. If there's anything that's true about me, I'm gonna grind and I'm gonna provide for my family. But I want to bring your, to a, your attention uh, to this idea that there's more than one way that you should be providing for your family. And, and financial, financial stability is great. And, 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 and good food is great, but there's more than just that in the way in which you provide for your family. I wanna tell you a little story. Recently, I, uh, I just, I kinda like advanced in my dad level this past week, right? And so uh, the way in which I leveled up as a dad was I finally purchased, well, with, with some help, thank, thankful to God uh, that, that he gave me this opportunity, uh, a zero turn mower, right? And so I'm leveled up now. Like I was, I was riding on my other lawnmower and it was breaking like every time I used it and I was just putting too much money into it and too much time. I was like, okay, at some point, like I gotta level up. And so I got a zero turn and I don't know if you got property and you've been riding with the steering wheel and, and, and you've made the switch to a zero turn, but it will change your life, all right? I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching the gospel this morning, all right? Um, but I leveled up, I got a zero turn, and then I drove up to Atlanta to pick up my wife's sister, 
right? And uh, I, I drove up there, and they're coming back with us. They're staying with us for a week because it's summertime, and uh, it's going to be awesome. But uh, I, I went up there, and when I got up there, my father-in-law had recently leveled up to a brand new big green egg. He had had this one that was like 25 years old. Uh, so a big, big green egg is a smoker. I don't know if you know. It's like that green, uh, I don't know what you call it. It looks like a big green egg, right? Um, and so it's a smoker, and uh, he leveled up. He got a bigger one, a newer one, and he gifted me with his old one. It was like the first ever model. It was like circa 1995, right? So it served him well. Um, but he, we, we loaded it up, put it in the back of my truck, and I now have a smoker. I don't know why he thinks that with me taking care of his three grand- grandchildren that I'll ever have time to smoke anything, right? But I now have a zero turn, and I, I now have three grilling options, right? I have my propane grill. I have my Blackstone, right? And now I have the big green egg. I have three grilling options, for the three times I cook a year, right? So, <laughs> so um, I've kind of leveled, uh, but the good news is, is that as much as I fail to provide food for my family because I don't cook a whole lot, um, the good news is that maybe I, I can succeed in some other area. And the truth is, is that, 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 that providing for your family looks a lot more, uh, it, it's a lot more than just putting food on the table. Godly men provide for their families physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And before you start ridiculing me about how, how uh, I don't cook as much as I should, and my wife probably cooks way more than she should, I want to bring your attention to the fact that as men, we're called to provide physically and financially, yes, but it's much, much more than that. We are called to provide emotional and mental support. Uh, if there's one thing I know to be true, I've done a lot of research on, on Generation Z. I'm a youth pastor, and so I, I fill my time reading about them and, and learning about that generation. And, and what I've learned is that for a lot of them, uh, they struggle with things, man. They struggle with things that, that previous generations didn't struggle with. They're, they have access to a lot of different things. And, and because they have access to a lot of different information, they're trying to process it all in their minds. And man, like teenagers today have, have more mental breakdowns than you can imagine. And you know what teenagers need from us as men? They need us to provide mental support. They need you to be there when they need to talk to somebody. They need you to provide for them the truth when they're trying to discern what is right and what is wrong. They need you to step up and say, this is wrong, this is right, and here's how we're going to work towards this truth, and here's how I'm going to be here for you in your journey of faith, and we're going to work through this together, and we're going to converse about this. And men need to step up and to step into situations and say, here's how I'm going to work through these, these issues that you're facing. You know what teens value more than anything else in the world? Than any other value, than any other characteristic. Teenagers today, they value this more than anything else. That is authenticity. In a world that's completely fake, full of social media posts that are completely fake, they're begging you to be real. Just be real, be genuine. Be there for them when they need help. And men, that is our responsibility in our homes to step up and say, I'm going to be real. And what does that look like? What does it look like to help your teenager through a mental breakdown? It means that you step up and you say, you know, sometimes you walk in humility and you say, sometimes I struggle with this too. If you're a dad and you haven't admitted your struggles to your kids, man, you're missing out on an opportunity to be real and genuine with them so that they can see from an example that how to deal with failure, how to deal with mess-ups, how to walk with them through their struggles. I struggle too, and I want to help you through this based on what I've learned from my own experience. Be real. You need to provide emotional support. If you're the kind of dad and your kid's crying, you're like, quit whining, right? I, 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 can, I can tell you, like, I, I'm guilty of that as much as anybody, right? I get annoyed by whining, but there's a reason your kid is feeling the way he does emotionally. 
And the moment that you can step up and, and to get on a knee and to hug them and to say, I don't know why you're feeling the way you're feeling, but I want to fix this. That's so much better than to just say, quit whining and, and, and to, you know, shove them into their room and put them in a timeout, right? It's so much better to actually fix the issues than it is to ignore them and to fix behavioral problems. I believe that, 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 that for a lot of the younger generation, the, the problem is, is that parents fix behavior issues, but they didn't fix heart issues. And for you as a dad, you're not just there to fix behavioral issues. You're there to speak to your children's heart. And I'm begging you to be real because your kids are begging you to be real. You're, you're, you're supposed to provide emotional and mental support. And ultimately, we are to, to provide spiritually. And I just, wanna, I just wanna say this. Men, if you're not praying and reading God's word with your family, man, you're missing, you're missing the whole point of it. If you're not regularly praying and reading scripture with your family, man, you're missing the point. You can put the, the, the most quality meat on the grill and put it on the table, but if you're not spending quality time with your kids and leading them to the Lord, man, you're not winning. And so I wanna encourage you to start doing that today. The beautiful thing is, is just how I talked about walking in humility. If you haven't done that in the past, the best thing that you could do is you could walk into your family and you could say, wife, I'm sorry that I haven't been leading you in this way. Children, I'm sorry that we haven't opened up God's word, but we're gonna start today. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the best thing you could do is to be honest, to be humble, and to say we're gonna start something new. It's not too late to start something new because it's not about how wealthy you are or the quality of meat you put on the grill. It's more about how spiritually healthy you are and the quality time you spend with your family. And it's time for us to start providing in more than just the way of putting food on the table. The third thing godly men do is that they sacrifice. We see this in the example of Jesus that he gave up his life for us. Godly men sacrifice. So you ask, what makes a man a man? That's how we started it, right? My answer is simply sacrifice. To me, look, look, let's look at these two images of, of men. To me, this guy is less of a man than this guy. To me, that is, that, that's a man. Someone that sacrificed his life. Go to the first picture. The only thing this guy sacrificed is his hair, right? He's taking steroids, he's like, that hair is going to go, right? It's going to be gone, right? And, and I could talk trash about this guy. Why? Because he's not in the room, right? If he was right here, he'd probably tap me on the chest and he'd, he'd probably say, how about I beat your butt right now? And I'd say, how about I draw a line down the middle of your head and make it look like a butt, right? So that was my dad joke for today. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but I can talk trash about him because he's, he's he, pr he probably, you know, he, he probably can't even fit through the doors, right? He sacrificed his, his hairline, his hair, and he also sacrificed his ability to fit through doorways, right? And so there's, that's the only thing this guy sacrificed. But the next guy, right, he sacrificed his life. He sacrificed his life for the people that he loved. He gave his time. He gave his energy. He gave himself so that others could benefit. And if you wanna know what makes a man a man, it's sacrifice. John 15, 13 says this, greater love hath no man than this, than a man that lay down his life for his friends. And men, this is the one that we struggle with more than anything. Why? Because we don't like laying down for anything, do we? You don't like laying down. As a man, you're, you're taught to stand up, right? To be firm to not lay down. And in this passage, we see what makes a man a man is when he lays down his life. And, and I want to encourage you this morning 
as important as it is for you to stand firm on what you believe, it's just as important for you to lay down and sacrifice yourself for your family. And, and, and sacrifice looks different for all of us. But what does it look like for you? Here's what I know to be true. Go back to that first image, right? You can spend your life and you can think uh, that, 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 that the manly man looks like the guy with all the muscles, right? You, you, can, you can start building your muscles. You can, start, you, you can think, well, the world tells me that this is what a man looks like. And so I'm going to spend my time in the gym away from my family, right? I'm going to spend all my time and all, like that dude spent a lot of time in the gym, Right? And he's got big muscles. That's great. There's nothing wrong with big muscles. There's nothing wrong with spending time in the gym. But here's the problem. You can go to a gym across America at any day, on any day, at any moment, and it's going to be full of guys that look like this. But you can go to a church on Sunday morning and find 61% female versus 39% male. And that's the problem. The problem is, is that men are not stepping up and leading their family. They'd rather go to a gym and look like that than sit in a pew and hear about God's word and how they can lead their family better. And the problem with families across America, the problem with children across America is that men are not sacrificing themselves to stand up for their family. They're not laying their, their lives down so that their family can succeed. They'd rather spend time away from their families fulfilling some dumb hobby or some dumb passion than to be passionate about leading their kids to know about Jesus Christ. And in a world that's begging for male leadership, it's time for us men to stand up It's time for us to, to lay our lives down. The first thing that you have to do in order to stand up and fulfill your purpose as a man is to lay your life down. So this morning, we're going to do something a little weird, right? But before we get there, I want to I read one more Scripture, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I remember when I first got married, I read this passage, and I read the verse before, and I love this, Ephesians chapter 5, because the verse before, how many of you guys know it? Wives, submit to your husband, Right? And I used to love this passage when I first got married, right? Because I just thought that that's where the chapter ended, right? Like, close case, let's go, right? You got to listen to what I say, right? I love marriage, right? I get to lead. I, could, I get to do whatever I want. I don't even have to listen to my mom or my dad anymore, right? Many of you married veterans, you know where that philosophy of marriage got me, right? And you know that that only leads to terrible disaster, Right? Um, but I had to learn that this passage only makes sense when you do the latter first. It only makes sense when husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so men, you got a problem at home? Is your marriage struggling? Is your wife struggling to submit to your authority, right? Let me, let me encourage you, don't argue anymore. Don't fight anymore. Don't make her submit to you in any kind of way. Don't use a loud voice. In that moment, if your wife is struggling to submit to your authority, stop, pause, go away from the, turn away from the situation, go to, by yourself and ask yourself, well, does she know that I'm loving her in a way that Christ loved me? Does she know that, 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 that ultimately what I want to see for her is for her to thrive and succeed more than I want to see myself thrive and su succeed? Does she know that I would lay down my life for her? Does she know that I am laying down my life for her? Have you been doing that? Have you been serving her in a way where it's easy for her to submit to your authority? Before you argue, before you fight, ask yourself that question. 
Am I willing to lay down my life for her at the expense of my time, my money, my desires? Does she know that? Does she know about my sacrificial love? And if the answer is no, stop arguing and love her in that way and watch what happens. Watch how God can work through that. And if that doesn't work, you can schedule a marital counseling session with Pastor Frank. He's in the office from Monday to Thursday, 9 to 5, all right? He'll help you. <laughs> He's not here, so. <clears throat> what does it look like to sacrifice men? What does it look like for you to lay down your life, to give your life up? Because the bottom line is that the measure of a man is not found in his stature, but in his sacrifice. Are you willing to do what it takes to lead your family by laying down your life? And so I mentioned we're going to do something weird this morning. I don't think we've ever done this, all right? Sometimes we have close, sometimes we close and uh, we have a time for commitment for all. But this morning, I think that it would be beneficial for us as, as men to lead in this moment, I think that, that it would be beneficial for our families that fathers would step up and lead in this moment. And so during this time, our, our musicians can go ahead and come forward. As we talk about sacrifice, as we talk about what it looks like to love your family, as, as we talk about how godly men do three things well, right? They, they construct. How are you building your family? Then they provide then they sacrifice. How are you sacrificing for your family? And so this morning, what we're gonna do is gonna be strange, but I think sometimes we get this idea that when you come to the altar, right, sometimes we think that, that it means when you come to the altar that your life is a complete mess and that you're about to make this decision in a moment that's gonna change your life forever, and you're, and you're worried about what people are gonna look at you, what they're gonna think, like, whoa, what that, what's that guy going through, right? We need to figure out what's going on in his life. He went to the altar today, right? But in reality, like, the altar is a place where we posture ourselves in humility, and we say, I don't have what it takes to get through my week unless I posture myself and pray and ask God for help. That's what the altar is. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of sacrifice. And, and let, me, let me put it to you this way. Like if you're able to come up here and pray this morning, I want you to do it as a man. I want your family, I want your wives, I want your children to see you need help from the Lord. You want to know how to be real for, for your kids, for your next generation, for the next generation? Admit your failures. Admit your dependency on the Lord. That's how, you're, that's how you would be real. Because it would be more beneficial for your kids to know that you need help from God for them to, rather than them thinking that you have it all together by the way that you handle things. It's more important for them to know that you're seeking the Lord for guidance and instruction and that that is what is leading their family rather than what they think that you know or they think that you have it all together. Because Surrender is always better than acting. And if your whole persona and the way that you lead your family is for them to, to, to think that you have it all together, it's just acting. It's performance. It's acting. Because you know as well as I know, leading a family is tough. And the only way you're able to lead a family well is by surrendering to Jesus Christ and allowing him to guide you through that. And so this morning, men, as we all stand up, you can go ahead and stand to your feet. Our time of commitment is for you. You can bring your family with you. And you can pray with them. But I wanna encourage you men 
let's come forward, get on our knees and ask God for help in the way that we lead our families. Let's pray and then, and then we'll move. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it goes forth. Lord, we thank you that you modeled manhood in the way that you gave up your life for us. Lord, you constructed something that has stood the test of time. And Lord, with your help, we can construct something that will do the same. Your word tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against what you have built. Lord, we thank you for, for being our daily bread, the bread of life. Lord, we thank you that when you get, gave us water, Lord, we never thirsted again. And so, Lord, I pray that in the way in which we provide for our families will be one that's lasting and sustainable because we're more committed to providing for them spiritually than we are for them physically. And Lord, I pray that we would sacrifice, surrender, lay our lives down so that we can lead our families well. In your name we pray, amen. Men move.